Hey guys, it's time for another ultralight airplane design video from the ultralight airplane workshop. It's been a while since we had a design video for the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. The last three videos, if I remember correctly, have been composite videos. So it's time to get back to doing a design video. Let's get to it. Before I forget about it, I want to thank Keith F. for being a fantastic supporter of the channel by being a designer tier patron on Patreon. Thanks, Keith. Now, let's get to it. Let's see if we can come up with an estimate on what the thrust and the horsepower for the motors are going to be on the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. And this is just going to be an estimate. Now it's very likely that in the future we'll try to get a little more accurate value. But for now, an estimate's going to be all we need. And let me tell you why I want that estimate and why we're doing it at this point. Now in the last design video we did, it was part one of calculating what the surface area is going to be on the vertical tail. The method we used in that video was the vertical tail volume. And by itself, that works pretty good. But it's not going to work very well for this particular airplane when we have two motors mounted on the wings. And if one of those motors fails for whatever reason, we're going to have an asymmetric thrust. And it's possible that that tail volume we calculated in part one is not going to be enough to deal with that asymmetric thrust. In other words, that rudder is going to have to be kicked over to counter thrust on one side of the airplane. And it's possible that with that tail volume method, that rudder just won't be big enough. So what we need to do is get that thrust estimate so that in part two of calculating the vertical tail surface area, we can hopefully get a better idea of what we need to counter that asymmetric thrust. So let's get on to calculating the thrust and horsepower estimates. We need some criteria to determine the horsepower for our airplane. Now we could just go out and just arbitrarily pick one that we like and then just hope that it's big enough for the airplane or not too big because of course for our part 103 ultralight airplanes we have a maximum cruise speed of 55 knots. A logical selection process would be to pick an engine that has the horsepower that matches the drag that we would have at our maximum cruise speed. In other words pick an engine that has just enough horsepower to push us to our maximum of 55 knots. Well, I did that some time ago, and after I did that, I went then to figure out, well, what would be the best rate of climb with that horsepower? And if I remember correctly, it was something like 200 feet per minute, and that was kind of low. So then I decided, well, what's another way to do it? And I looked at some of the other ultralight uh, climb rates. And there was quite a range, about uh, 500 feet per minute was kind of the minimum. So I decided, well, let's just pick 800 feet per minute. And that was kind of arbitrary. I don't need a great big engine. I don't want to have to go way out of my way to keep that maximum cruise speed down. Because um, if I pick an engine that can do 800 feet per minute in uh, maximum rate of climb, then it can probably push me over the 55 knot maximum cruise speed. But there's ways to deal with that. This uh, 800 feet per minute is somewhat arbitrary, but kind of in a range of other ultralights. And so let's go with that and uh, see what we can do with it. As you may remember from our previous video on the UWS-1 design, where we calculated the thrust estimate, or at least a first estimate of that thrust, uh, needed for various speeds, you should recognize this diagram where the x-axis is speed and this y-axis is total drag of the airplane. So in order to fly at a particular speed, we need thrust that overcomes this drag, so basically equal to the drag. So for example, over here, roughly 55 knots, we would need a about 40 pounds of thrust in order to fly at a constant speed of 55 knots. And by the way, I'm not going to inundate you with this math over here if I can avoid it. We will come to it a little bit, but I'm kind of going to gloss over it. But this green line is represented by this total drag equation. 
Now, we get our best rate of climb at our best lift to drag estimate. Our best lift to drag is going to be where this line is at its lowest. So it's around 40 knot. And that's just eyeballing it. We can actually calculate what that's going to be. Now, don't let this equation scare you. It's basically that equation we just looked at, this one, and we perform an operation on it called a derivative, and then we set it equal to zero, and that will give us our minimum value of that green line we were just talking about, and that turns out to be 39.9 knots. And by the way, that's at a gross weight of 448 pounds. That's with a uh, standard pilot and a parachute of a legal ultralight airplane at uh, 254 pounds empty weight. And that matches what we looked at visually. We said about 40 knots. By substituting this velocity back into this equation, we can find out what the drag is at that value. And we find out it's 32.4 pounds. And if you want to find out a little bit more about this approach, if you're kind of interested in the details and the math, uh, this reference down here, Aircraft Design, a Conceptual Approach by Raymer, is uh, where I got this information. All right, now we know that to maintain a straight level flight at this 40 knots, we need 32.4 pounds of thrust. But what are we going to have to do to climb? Well, we need even more thrust. And that's what we're going to calculate here. Now uh, we got some more equations here, and again, this one here is a vertical speed component, in other words, the up and down component, not the uh, horizontal component, that we can calculate using uh, this equation, where V is our horizontal speed, we got thrust, we got weight, and we got our lift to drag. And again, this comes from that same reference I just mentioned, the uh, aircraft design and conceptual approach by Raymer. What we can do is rearrange this to solve for thrust. So we know what our vertical speed should be, which is our 800 feet per minute. And we know what our velocity is, our 40 knots. We know what our weight is. We know what our lift to drag is. All we need to know then is what is that total thrust? And so by rearranging it, we get this equation and we substitute in the values here. So we got our drag of 32 our weight of 440 pounds, our forward velocity of 40 knots, so on. Once we substitute all that in, we get a total thrust in order to climb at 800 feet per minute at our best lift to drag, 40 knots, of 112 pounds of thrust. Now we got two motors, so you cut that in half, so for each motor we need 56 pounds of thrust. And we can calculate what that climb angle is going to be relative to horizontal. And that's another equation that comes from up here at this reference. And we get roughly 10 degree climb angle. Now we have a number for the thrust we need to climb at 800 feet per minute at our best rate of climb. But how much horsepower would we need to do that? Well, here's an equation for that. And that's from that same reference I was mentioning before. The uh, aircraft design, a conceptual approach by Raymer. This is pretty easy. This is the thrust, which we already have. Our velocity, 550, and then this is the efficiency of the prop. So how efficient is it at turning shaft horsepower into thrust? And we're going to calculate for just one motor here. So like we said before, thrust for one motor is 56 pounds, and our velocity is 40 knots. Now that uh, does not include our vertical component, but that's really pretty small compared to our horizontal component, so that's okay to just consider the 40 knots. And a recommendation for the efficiency of the propeller is 55%, which is 0.55. And this is recommended by Holloman in Modern Aircraft Design on page 33. And that's for efficiency when you're at a decent climb angle. It's likely that our efficiency will be different, but at least for our first estimate, this 55% will work. Well, we go through and plug all that into here and we come up with 12 and a half horsepower. So if you include two motors together, it's around 25 horsepower. So it's a pretty good estimate for what we're going to need for the horsepower for the USW-1 ultralight airplane. As I mentioned before, one of the driving factors for coming up with this video at this point is trying to figure out the thrust we're going to have to deal with when we have one motor die and the other one's going at full blast. 
And what is the worst condition for that to happen in? Now, you could say stall, but if you're at the stall and just about anything happens, <laughs> you're, you're probably going to end up stalling or starting a spin regardless. But in general, you're not going to be at the stall condition. So other than the stall condition, what condition would we frequently be at where having one of those motors die is a really bad deal? Well, it's very likely to be at our best angle of climb. One of the reasons for that is that the slower you go, the less effective your rudder is. And the rudder is what we have to use to counter the yaw caused by one motor dying and the other one being at full blast. So the slower your speed is, the worse your condition is. And best angle of climb is what you're going to use to climb out from at an airport where you're going to have to climb over some object, like a 50-foot tree at the end of the runway. And at best angle of climb, you're flying at a slower speed. In fact, you're usually not too far from the stall speed. In fact, the FAA says that the uh, condition for dealing with this yaw condition with one engine dying can't be more than 1.2 times your clean stall speed. And it turns out that's frequently not too far from best angle of climb. So let's figure out what our best angle of climb is and our speed at best angle of climb. And then we can use that later when we're working on our tail size for dealing with the one engine out condition. Well, here's the equation for that. And again, it's that same reference I mentioned before from Raymer. Well, we need to know what that slower speed at our best angle of climb is going to be. Well, it turns out that you can use a fairly easy relationship that's again is from this same reference that I've used before and that's if you take the velocity at minimum drag and remember that's around 40 knots so 39.9 and you multiply it by 0.76 you'll almost always come up with the speed that you need for best angle of a climb and that turns out to be 30.3 knots and then by using our drag equation, we can plug our values in and get 36.6 pounds of drag or thrust for level flight here of 30.3 knots. Well, let's figure out what the efficiency of our prop is going to be. And it turns out it's not the same as it was at our best rate of climb where we used uh, that 55%. The efficiency of our prop is going to be different. We used 55% before. We can't use that again. The slower we go, the less efficient our prop is going to be. And that's for a fixed pitch prop, which is probably what we'll be using just to help save weight. Well, fortunately, we have a pretty nice way of estimating what the prop efficiency is going to be at our lower speed. And we're going to take advantage of a chart that is in another reference. It's called Aerodynamics, Aeronautics, and Flight Mechanics by McCormick. And this shows efficiency of a prop as you change something called the advanced ratio. And the advanced ratio is just velocity divided by number of blades and the diameter of your blades. So assuming that of course your diameter of your prop and number of blades stays the same, we're really just talking about speed changing along this x-axis. So just using this equation down here, which is at a lower speed, and of course we're going to be flying very slow. Let's assume that uh, our prop efficiency kind of follows this curve. So let's come up here to where our 55% prop efficiency is. And that's uh, right around in here. So at advance ratio of 0.3 is where we have roughly 55%. Well, if we look at this line right here, we have nearly a linear relationship. So for example, if you took half the speed, you should get half the efficiency. Well, here we're talking about taking 75% of the speed, so we should get 75% of the efficiency. So if you take your 30 divided by 40, you get roughly 0.75, you multiply by that 55% efficiency, and voila, we now have 42% efficiency for our best angle of climb. Well, now we can plug that into our equation along with all the other numbers we had. And, of course, this equation is this one up here that we had. Okay, so our vertical speed is going to be this part here. So our vertical speed turns out to be 530 feet per minute. 
That's quite a bit less than the 800 feet per minute we had for best rate of climb, but it's not too bad really. It's still a pretty good uh, rate of climb. So what total thrust do we need in order to fly forward at roughly 30 knots and still climb at 530 feet per minute? Well, we run it into this wonderful little equation here and we get a thrust of 57 pounds per propeller. So 114 pounds altogether. Now that's versus 125 we had before, but a lot of that's because we have a lower efficiency. Well, guess what we can do now? We can go to our calculation for our next method for calculating the surface area for the vertical tail. And we know that side that is thrusting at best rated climb, if one of those props gives out, the side still thrusting is gonna be pushing at 57 pounds of thrust. And keep in mind for this video, where it's coming up with a first estimate for horsepower and the thrust in various conditions. When we go to consider the one engine out condition, we're gonna actually have more drag that we have to deal with. And we'll probably have to go back and recalculate all this. And the things we need to think about is we're probably gonna have some flax put in to uh, help with that climb and that's gonna add a little bit of drag. It, you know, something like 10% flaps. And we're probably gonna have some aileron drag cause we'll have to lift one wing. And we'll talk a little more about that when we get into the uh, video on the surface area for the vertical tail. And in addition, of course, we're gonna to have to counter that yawing thrust from the one motor with the rudder and that's gonna create a little more drag too. So all that drag is actually gonna make us a little bit slower and so we'll have to recalculate some of that thrust values that we got here on that uh, maximum angle of climb. Well, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. And we've got, uh, as you can see, a lot more videos to go. But it shouldn't be too long, I'm hoping, before we can start making some parts for that rudder. Uh, once we figure out that surface area for the vertical tail, we'll start getting into loads that'll be uh, encountered by that vertical tail. We'll need to do that before we can actually start building the rudder. We need to figure out how strong to make that rudder. And before someone jumps in here and starts complaining, I want to mention that we're really not considering operational procedures for the airplane. If we were, we'd take a little more consideration about what we have to do when one of those engines dies. For example, if you're in a climb and an engine dies, you're suddenly at half power, which means the airplane is gonna rapidly start slowing down. So you've got to nose over pretty quick or you'll stall the airplane. And at the same time, you gotta stomp on the rudder on the same side that you have the thrusting engine to counter that yaw. For now, that's not something we have to uh, take into consideration on the aerodynamics. We will come up with a performance chart and operational procedure for the airplane at some point in the future. So there's a few more videos to come, but it won't be quite as much the aerodynamics, although, of course, some of that will be in there for determining the loads. So stay tuned.